Just okay. All right, it's uh, time to get started. So we're here today to talk to you about Horizon dashboard plugins. Uh, kind of give you a, a deep view of kind of where we're at and where we're headed. Um, some of the things that you can do with them. Uh, agenda. We're going to talk about them. We're going to talk about where we're going. Uh, some new stuff in them, and then also uh, a, a new use case and a demo. So plugins in Horizon. Uh, just a little timeline. Um, Horizon officially became part of OpenStack way back in Essex. Uh, at that time, customize, customizing Horizon was essentially either um, building a custom Django app on top of Horizon, um, hacking directly into the Horizon code, or using a customization module, which was basically a glorified tool for doing monkey patching. Um, in the Icehouse release, we introduced the first rev of plugins for uh, Horizon. Um, it was fairly crude support, it was, but it, you could support the Django content in, in the plugins. Um, and we've slowly been adding to that since then. You can see in Juno, we added some support for collecting of static files, uh, CSS, JavaScript, images. Um, also support for Angular JS modules, as well as specify or including new exception types. Uh, so if I'm talking to a different service, it's returning an exception that I, I in, from the API that I'm not that Horizon currently didn't know about. You could you know you could add that as well. Um, in Kilo we added some testing features. So for Angular code, you could actually write a spec file. Um, so that spec file could be run as part of Horizon's test suite. Um, and then in Liberty, we added some auto discovery of JavaScript. It, for a while there, uh, you were having to line item every JavaScript file out uh, in, in our plugin file. Um, so this was a great simplification. You, we're collecting uh, SCSS now, um, as well as um, we also transitioned to having all of our content being loaded via a plugin mechanism. So we're not only trying to push this on you, um, this is actually what we're using internally. Uh, and that's true for the content. Our APIs are not exactly this, our API connection is not exactly uh, using the same mechanism, but it, uh, at least all the content's coming in. So it's, it's our commitment to it. So what can you do with the plugin? Um, we're going to cover a little naming just to make sure we're all on the same page. Horizon has some names here that uh, are not standard, but I hear them referenced differently all the time. Um, so we have some navigation elements on the, that you can see. The top level navigation element is a dashboard. Um, and that, all that is is a container for content, essentially. Uh, it's a way of subdividing. Inside of those, you have another, yet, another level of subdivis subdivision, which is a panel group. Um, and then below that, where the content actually lives, are, are called panels. Um, and so the, the top two are navigation, and once we start getting down to the panel level, that's where we're starting to talk about actual content. And then in the plugin scope of things, um, the pan panel content is fair game. Once you once you specify the panel, you can you can put whatever content on you want uh, on there you want. You can have it be JavaScript driven. You can have it be uh, Python, Django driven. You name it. Um, so what can we do with them? Well, you can add dashboards, panel groups, or panels. Uh, they, are, they are just pointing out, um, I've added a new panel group called Tools and a couple panels in there. Um, so we can add content. Uh, we can remove content. So if we go back one, ah, there we go. At the bottom, there's a whole identity dashboard. Um, perhaps that doesn't pertain to my deployment. Um, with a very simple edit of a of a plug, uh, enabled file, we can, we can eliminate that whole dashboard from even loading into the UI. So, nice feature. Um, and then, you can reorder them. Uh, that's one of the features, too, is we, you, can, you can move everything around. So, in this example, I've moved the identity dashboard up to the top, and I moved the project dashboard down to the bottom. But you can do that with individual panels or panel groups, or you can even move a panel from one panel group to another panel group. Uh, basically, just a way to say, this is how I want my view to be laid out. Um, and then the other thing is, so maybe I created this new panel in the tools uh, panel group, and I think this is what everybody should land on when they come in, because it's the most important thing. So I can specify that as the default panel. So when somebody comes and logs in, that's the first panel they see. Uh, you can do the same thing with, uh, well, you can do it per dashboard, and you can also set a default dashboard. 
So how, how do the plugins actually work in Horizon? Well, they're an installable Python module um, or Python package. Uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of wiring in a file. It's called an enabled file uh, that kind of specifies the contents of your plugin. Um, and then that gets tied into Django's applications. So you're basically adding, Django uses the term application to specify content. And so what you're doing is adding content. Um, you're, adding, you're adding a new Python module to the content list. Um, and Horizon's taking care of this behind the scenes. Oh, sh that was bad. Hold on, hold on. Silly Max. All right, there we go. Let's do that. Um, so what's the structure of a plugin? Um, like I said before, there's an enable file. Uh, we happen to call them enabled files just because they ended up in a directory called enabled. Um, it's it's poor. Oh yes. Yes. So you're going to create. What's that? What's the name of that package? No, you're going to create the package. So you're going to create a, a, a installable Python module. So what we're so that's what this is. Uh, the plugin there is the is the is the plugin. Um, so you're going to want to have some packaging information in there so you can create a Python package. Uh, you want an enabled file that's going to specify the content, um, and then basically it's a bunch of links to to how Horizon should interpret what you've just presented to it. And then there's actually the content. And so in this example, um, we have an API. So in Horizon, we have something called the API directory uh, the, where all, we handle all the connections to the services. So we've just duplicated this in the plugin. Uh, you can name it whatever you want. Um, so in there, we have something that would talk to a, you know, a different service that's probably not already in OpenStack. Um, and then we actually have the, the content below that. Uh, it's typical Django content. Um, again, you can, as long as you're getting to the point where you can render data with it, it doesn't matter if it's if it's pure Django or if it's mostly JavaScript. Um, so that's a typical content. Again, it's just you're taking some content, uh, an enabled file, and packaging it up so you can go install it somewhere in the in the Python path on your system. Um, so in, we'll go. There we go. That enabled file. So that again, that's how we do all the wiring. Uh, so I was gonna. There we go. Yep. Uh, in the last slide, is there a logic <coughs> behind the number you put in that? Ah, uh, yes. Good point. Yes. Sorry. So I said you could order all the. Uh, you could order all the content. That number is basically specifying the, the ordering. So each of the enable files has a number, and that tells it how to plug in. Um, there's also a there's also a hierarchy of how these files are loaded in. So it's like uh, the uh, big the number is, the higher priority it matters. Uh, actually, it's more of a numerical order. So one would load before 2,000, um, and then we have a couple of different directories where those get loaded into, uh, and I'll get to that in just a second. But yeah, the number the number is significant in the fact that uh, it does it does specify where. And if I specified that exact same num that exact same file name um, in a later loading directory, it will it will supplant the content. But we'll we'll cover that in just a sec. Um, so some things that we can set up in the plugins. This is actually the the entire list of potential settings uh, at this point. Um, the first one is the most important. It's just specifying the application or the actual module that you're loading into Horizon. Um, the exceptions we talked about, some Angular stuff we talked about, JavaScript. So we're just specifying content. Um, the auto discovery one, Sean will talk about in just a few minutes. Uh, but that's a new, that's a new thing that kind of gets rid of the add.js files to a certain degree. Um, and then we're just you can specify whether you want it to be enabled or not. Just, we oddly named disabled first. Um, <laughs> But that's, that's it. That's basically all the content you're putting in. So the first one will look like a Python path. Um, yeah. Let's see. Let's go back. Yeah, that's, that's basically what I want to tell, tell you about that. Um, and so there's two methods of actually using the plugin. Um, there's a very simple one uh, that is you can copy that file, uh, the enabled file. So in that example, it was underscore 2000 log panel dot pi. You can copy that into the local enabled directory inside of Horizon. Um, when you do that, 
when Horizon boots up or starts up with Apache, it goes and it walks through that folder and it'll see that there's a new file on there and it'll go and try and resolve all the, po the paths and pull that into Horizon. So that's how you get the content in. There's actually a more powerful way to do it. It's a little more cumbersome. Um, but this is all settings based. And so for a lot of deployers, they, wanna, they don't want to have to muck with the file system as much as they want to be able to drive it through settings. And so in, this in the second part, you could, um, you could edit your local settings file to pull in the plugin itself. Um, and then you can, it, with this addition, you can actually do use policy files um, and sp settings specific to the plugin. Uh, that, that's missing in the other um, method. So it designates an example here where they do have a policy file and they've built a plugin with, with it. And so they use a second mechanism so that they can um, guard actions with policy so the user doesn't see things that they can't actually do. I promise this to say something about that. Oh, so where are we? This is where we are at with, uh, so there, there's a huge family tree of plugins uh, for Horizon. I have all the content that's actually delivered in Horizon in, in that box. Um, so we have, to, we're supporting 10 services inside. Um, I went out and actually looked at the OpenStack namespace in uh, Git or GitHub. Um, and there's, there's some names in there I don't honestly recognize, but it's obviously, uh, popular interface, and, that, and this, this is the mechanism they're using to get content in. Um, as we move forward, uh, the Horizon team is actually going to concentrate more on shared, con shared componentry inside of Horizon um, and move some of the content, like Trove and Sahara, outside. Because it's not, it's not really a shared resource. Um, and so the Trove and Sahara are moving very quickly, and they want a lot of content uh, changes, and that's wonderful. Um, we have a relatively small size team and we, we, we can get changes in but not as fast as they would like them. So they should be in control of their own content a little bit more. Um, so in the next cycle, we'll actually move those out into separated plugins as well. Um, and that's, that's, and that, that'll allow us to focus on making Horizon a better toolkit to support the plugins even, even better. Um, so what's new in Liberty? Sean, we'll take it over from here. Thank you. Oops. Thank you. Uh, static file, auto discovery mechanism for the plugins. Uh, all the static files that is for the client side the computing and the rendering are get discovered automatically and organized in the right order and get populated into the production page and test runner for you. Uh, static files include JavaScript file that is using uh, Angular framework and HTML file that as a Angular templates and SSS files. And all the Angular model names will be added to the system automatically as the dependency. So the owner JavaScript get automatically ordered based on naming convention. Now JavaScript files that define Angular module will be named as .module.js and the files define unit test will be named as .spec.js and the files provide mark object for unit test will be named as .spec.js mark.object.js and all the other JavaScript file that defines Angular providers will be named to something else. And the order will be in production, models will come first and then providers. In test runner, it is models and providers and marks and specs. There is no need for manually to maintain a JavaScript list, which is tedious and error prone. To enable 
or to discovery for your plugin, it's simple. You put all the Angular names, Angular module names in the add Angular modules list and put your SCSS files in the add SCSS files list and just uh, put the auto discovery static files equals true and the system will do the own magic for you. Okay, thank you, Sean. Thank you, David. Um, so, put, put on the sign, come on. All right, uh, so David talked about how uh, easy it is for you to add your own custom dashboard and your own custom panel, but it leaves a lot, of, uh, a lot more that we desire. And uh, Sean just recently covered his auto discovery stuff, which allows you to basically dynamic dynamically uh, locate static resources in your project, right? So when you take these two and you combine them, what you end up with is, drum roll, JavaScript plugin. Okay, so how does that work? What we're gonna do is we're gonna walk over a use case and then we're gonna dive into the JavaScript plugin architecture. Okay, so keep in mind that this use case here is actually a uh, real world example. This is a problem that uh, you know, a real team is, is facing. It, we're not, this is not a hypothetical situation. So uh, let's assume that you have uh, team A, I mean, sorry, blue team and red team represented by David and, and Sean here. And uh, they, they both want to modify an existing workflow. Uh, you know, blue team wants to add its own custom step and red team wants to add its own custom step. Now, the only way to do that today would be to one, you have to modify source, or two, you have to monkey patch. Now, both of these methods, you have to basically do your own uh, manual resolution, right? And this is not ideal. We wanna, we wanna be in a scenario where blue team can do its own thing, red team can do its own thing. They, do, they both do their pip install and just everything just magically works. Okay, so uh, before we do that, we're gonna, again, level set and just cover some common terminologies. Actually, this is the wrong wrong slide. This this is the, this is the correct one. Okay. So what what is a wizard? Well, everyone's familiar with a wizard, right? I mean, you know, you've done that probably throughout your life with Microsoft software installation. It's pretty much a step by step uh, guide that you have to sort of fill out along the way, and then at the very end, you can take some kind of action. Um, what does the code for that look like? Uh, it's actually really simple. The wizard is has four properties. It has close, cancel, submit, and uh, workflow. A submit is really just a callback function, so when you click on that submit button, you do something, right? Uh, workflow, that's really just a JavaScript object that tells the wizard how to draw things. So we're gonna cover that next. What is a workflow? So a workflow, again, is the thing that you see on the left, whatever, you know, the, the visual manifest, manifestation of that. And uh, what does the code for that look like? So workflow is a service. And think of a service as a glorified singleton JavaScript object, OK? And with a JavaScript object, you can, you know, you can easily manipulate that. Uh, with, with a workflow, you have a title. You have some text for your buttons. And most importantly, you have a list of steps that you're going you're gonna to have in that workflow. And uh, these steps are really just composed of a title and uh, a template URL. So in this case, the step has a controller and, a, and a, an HTML template. We're going to cover what, that, what, what kind of content you should have in that controller. It's, it's really easy. So if you think about it, uh, this is MVC, right, at its basis. Uh, the controller is where you, you can pull in your data, and uh, it binds it to the view, which is your HTML page. And in this controller, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, I have a user uh, object that's initially blank. And as I'm filling out the form, this user object is going to get populated with key value pairs. Okay? And we also have a watch collection on that user object so that every time this user object changes in property, uh, we, we are aware of the change. And we broadcast this change to the parent controller 
So this is really important, and we'll, we'll cover why that is important in a little bit. So again, this is a UML diagram of what we just talked about. The very top, you have the wizard moto controller, which depends on a workflow service where you define your workflow with a list of steps. And these steps then point to these uh, individual uh, component that you see here in the green region, okay? So how does that relate to what we have today? Uh, today we have tables. And at the very top here where it's highlighted in red, you'll see that you can click on this button to basically launch this wizard, okay? This is called, our, this is called a batch action. And again, it follows a similar model where you have a table controller which has some HTML. The table controller populates data which then gets shown in that HTML page. And then this table controller depends on this batch action service which is an object that contains a list of other services, in this case actions, right? We have a create action service and a delete action service that this batch action includes. So when we put it together, what we end up with is this really big diagram, but it's really easy if we take it one step at a time. What we see is all the services here that are marked with a jigsaw puzzle, they're extensible. You can extend them, you can override them, you can manipulate them. And the things that we see in the purple and green regions are, are uh, additional things that we can add to it. So in this case, you can add additional actions and additional steps, okay? Um, this will be a little bit more clear in a little bit when we go over the demo, so I'm gonna hand it over to Cindy to actually show you how to codify this. But keep in mind, in the back of your head, the, the use case that was covered earlier, because the demo will address that. Okay, so before we um, take a look at the demo, um, let's look at the um, create user action which we're gonna modify. Okay, so this is the same table that Ty showed earlier. So if you click on this batch action, or this action, you'll see that um, we're using the wizard and the workflow is broken down into two steps, user details and select projects. So user details is the basic um, bare minimum information that you need to fill out in order to create a user. So if we do that, let's call our user Yoda and then password, enter a password in. So if we enter in a wrong password, it immediately tells us that we entered in a wrong password, whereas before in our create user um, uh, modal window, we had to create on the submit button in order to make a back tri uh, round trip call um, to the back end to check that the password was entered correctly. So let's put in a correct password. Okay, so once we filled out the bare minimum, we see that the um, uh, submit button is enabled, but let's take a look at the second step. It's called select projects. So here we can select, we can assign our user to multiple projects. So let's assign our user to um, an admin project and a demo project and change the role to uh, let's see, change this role to service. And this is a feature that was, um, that has been in a Keystone um, API, but it was uh, Keystone V3 API, but it was not implemented in um, Horizon before, but now with Angular, we can enable that. So we filled in all our information and let's create our user. So it was, our user was created instantly, as you can see here, um, no lag at all. Um, let's go to the projects panel to make sure that the user was um, created successfully, double check. Um, so if we come here, uh, we can check our manage members and in here, yes, we see Yoda is created successfully and also in admin. Um, yes, we have our service role for our user. Okay, so before we go into the demo, let's um, recap our use case again. We have the blue team and the red team, and they both want to add a step to the workflow um, that we looked at earlier. 
And we don't want them to have to modify source code or have to manually merge conflicts um, between um, each other. So uh, I promise that it works and we will show you in a live demo. Um, fingers crossed that it works. Okay. So we have our blue plugin and red plugin. Um, these are separate from the Horizon folder. Um, I've put them on my desktop. So um, we'll take a look inside. These two are exactly the same except for the name. We have um, uh, blue and then red. That's the only difference. Um, so if we take a look inside our, file our plugin structure, we see that all our files are under the static folder. Um, this is how our client-side code is organized in Horizon, and this enables um, us to auto-discover uh, auto all the static files. Um, this is a feature implemented by Sean. Um, so if you write your Angular plugin, make sure to keep all your files under the static folder. So let's take a look at our first file. Um, so in here, our module is um, referencing uh, the identity user's uh, namespace. And here on line 26, we inject in the create user workflow that we want to modify. Um, once the, um, all the modules are loaded and all the dependencies are resolved, we will run this block of code down here. So we define our step as Ty referred to earlier. So this is a new step that we want to inject into our workflow. So we have ID, title, template URL refers to the HTML content we want to put into our step. And help URL is some um, content that we want to put into our slide out panel on our uh, wizard. And um, once we have this, um, our create workflow service is making use of Justin Pomer Pomeroy's um, extensibility service, which um, allows us to uh, append, prepend, replace, remove the steps. And in the future, we want to use this extensibility service for other UI components like um, batch actions and actions. So um, we call the, we use workflow and then we're gonna prepend our steps. So we have two steps right now. We wanna add a new step to the front. Okay, so uh, we're gonna take a look at our template um, HTML file. So let's take a look at that. So here, this is just the content for our blue step. Uh, in the first line, we have a reference to our controller. This is where we handle the view model logic. Um, our second line is just the title of our step, and we use a translate attribute. This attribute uh, was um, implemented um, and released in the Liberty uh, cycle, and this allows us to collect and translate all our client-side text. So blue plugin can be translated. And um, down below, here's some uh, sub, some caption for our step, and we have two input fields, favorite color and favorite food. Very basic. Uh, so let's take a look at our help content. So this is just plain HTML and we're using our translate um, attribute again, as you can see. And last but not least, um, the most important file for our step is the controller. So in our controller, we are injecting our wizard event. This allows us to intercept our data and then we can modify this and or sub, uh, take this data and send it off to an external, our own external service to do something with it. So in our simple example, um, we are just going to capture the events and just print out some um, trivial messages on our browser console. So uh, we went through all the files in our plugin. Um, red is exactly the same, except for instead of using prepend, we used append, so it'll be after the, the steps. So now, okay, to bring, to bring these two plugins into Horizon, um, we wrote a really short little script, and we'll kind of talk about the script before we um, check out, uh, see everything in action. Okay, so this is our short little script. Um, so in here, um, we are going to go into the uh, blue plugin and red plugin, and we're just going to tar up these two files. And then we're going to copy over our enabled file from each of these into Horizon. These files are read up at startup, and then that allows us to register the plugin to Horizon. And then we're going to uh, pip install these two tar files and then start up our test server. So if everything goes well, this should work. So we're going to run our short little script. Okay, 
It looks successful, no errors. So let's go to our browser. Oops, okay. So we're gonna open this up again. Okay, ready everyone, drum roll, drum roll please. <laughs> okay, boom, we have, instead of two steps, we have four steps now. So the blue step was prepended and the red step was appended. So in our blue plugin, we see the, con the text is blue and then um, we have our two input fields that we saw earlier. And then if we go to red step, we see that um, it's the same except the text is red. And then if we look over here, we have our help text as well, it was just basic HTML. So let's close this up. Um, also, if we look at our browser console, we'll see our events that we triggered. So we see wizarded switching step, so we were like clicking around, so those registered over here. So um, you can see how powerful the extensibility service is, and now you have finer control over all your HTML um, components, and if you want to customize anything, now that now that you can, this is a feature that a lot of um, users wanted before, and now we, it's possible. And let's hand it over to Ty for a recap. Thank you, Cindy. So a uh, recap. Okay, uh, how do I get back? Oh, here it is. Okay. Loading. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Okay, um, if you want to try out that demo, um, it's a little complicated, but um, all these things are uh, in review right now, but you will need to uh, merge these two patches um, and then download Ty's plugin um, example and then follow the readme to install the plugin. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, quick recap. All right, so it was obvious from the demo that you know there were performance improvements. When you click on that user, it was like created instantly. Amazing. Okay, and, uh, <laughs> it addresses the complex use case that we, you know, we kind of covered earlier. Uh, it also allows you more granular control over your content, enables parallel development, so red team and blue team, you know, they don't have to fight for stuff. Uh, as you can see, we had customization hooked. There were a lot of events, so you can register too. And this, you know, again, this flexible and modular architecture can be extended to other things like table columns in the future, perhaps. Uh, resources, you can find, uh, you know, you can find all four of us on IRC. Here's our IRC channel. We also include our, our, our email. And Sydney here is volunteered to answer all of your questions. So, you know, just hop on. And uh, lastly, you know, I just wanted to have sort of a leaving note, I guess. Uh, right now is a really good time to be a Horizon developer. You know, we have a lot of really exciting things going on. And uh, this, this new plugin thing really opens the door to a bunch of new cool stuff. So, you know, if you're starting from scratch and you're a plugin developer, consider using this model. And if you're an existing plugin developer, consider migrating to this, maybe. And, uh, you know, if you're a key decision maker, we, we really hope that you can continue to enable your folks so that they can contribute upstream to this uh, great success. Thank you. We're going to open up to questions. If you can uh, step up to the mic if you have questions, that would be great. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I have uh, some architectural question. These steps in uh, the wizard work workflow, they seem completely independent. Is there a possibility for one step to rely on some data from the previous steps? Curious. Um, so the answer is yes, it, that's entirely possible. That's why we have that event registration mechanism. So if, if there's another step that depends on the previous step, you can register to that event. Oh. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, they are completely independent. Mm -hmm. You can treat them like such.
All right, any other questions? <laughs> Are you all too dazzled? <laughs> I have one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so let's say that uh, if you want to create a plugin for an external service, uh, can you use, like, can you get some identity information from uh, OpenStack so you can use that as, like, uh, the credentials for the external service or something yeah, like that? Yeah, that's entirely possible. So you have, like, uh, we, we have API for Keystone, right? So you can invoke that, and then you can register to certain events so that when you're creating this user, you can hook onto that event and then point that to your external plugin for future processing. Thank you. In a workflow, when I have a step, is there any mechanism wherein I can get the value which is in that step before actually submitting the workflow? Uh, actually, you can, for example, in the large instance, we have a centralized module for the owner steps. So when you put the submit button there, you will get the data from the module. The model is not specific for each uh, step. It's class all the steps. But if you want, you can also put every step as an independent, have its own model. It's totally up to you. I do want to be clear. We are supporting two separate frameworks at this point, and that is true for the Angular workflow. There's still a Django workflow that doesn't support any of these new additions. Um, so that's one of the reasons we're really excited about Angular is the, be the ability to do this. Um. All right. Thank you very much, everybody.